We wanted to go to Norman Wells because we had friends who were the Indian agents at uh, Fort Norman. And uh, so we flew there to visit them. And then we took uh, Han, who was the mother, and the daughter, Marlene, with us to um, see the midnight sun in Inuvik. And <clears throat> we spent the night there. And it was a beautiful, beautiful sight. We, we all spent the night, but it was daytime all the time. But it was daytime all the time. And uh, in the morning, we uh, were ready to go back to Fort Norman to deliver our passengers. And Hans said to me, after we took off, I don't know, we have to go back. And I said, what in the world for, Han? We're not going back. And she said, well, we were there overnight, and we never told anybody what happened to Mickey. And they're going to spend the rest of their lives wondering. And I said, well, they'll have to do that, because we're not going back. <laughs> So we went back to Fort Norman, or Norman Wells actually is where we landed, and then we went by boat to Fort Norman where they lived. And uh, now, excuse me for interrupting. What lake is is Norman Wells on? What lake would have you been going across by boat? We were going down the the river. Oh, um, it's the river. The, the it's not a lake. no, it's the. Um, Oh, you know the, the Mackenzie River. Mackenzie River. <laughs> you couldn't see from one side to the other. That's, it was that's such. How broad the river is. That's how broad the river was. Yeah. And we went by boat. Uh, there were two boats of us, and the the priest drove one and. and uh, native drove the other, yeah. and we had taken comic books for their children because they had run out, <laughs> and uh, we had Janet with us, our daughter, so they all sat in the bottom of the boat and read comic books, <laughs> and we kept telling them how they were missing all the beautiful scenery, and they didn't care. That's kids for you. That's kids for you. So anyway, we went back to uh, Fort Norman and had our visit with them, and then we brought their two children back to Pinoka with us so they could start school in September with and stay with their grandparents who lived in Pinoka. That worked out well. It was a wonderful trip. Well, yes, we always went south in the winter to get out of the snow. And that year we took Janet with us, who was 10 years old. And uh, another couple from Saskatchewan, who had a plane the same as ours, we met them in San Angelo. Okay. And then we all headed south to Mexico. Also. McAllen was in Texas, yeah. And then you cleared customs into Reynosa, Mexico. Yes. And next stop was Guadalajara. Guadalajara, yeah. And we spent the night in Guadalajara, and Raymond had trouble with his plane, and he had to have a part come in from Mexico City, so they had to stay. And I said to Raymond, well, how are we going to go over to Puerto Vallarta? Because I've never been there before. And he said, you just fly west till you hit the water. And that's Puerto 
So we started out on our own and uh, got to the, saw the water and got there and went to land and there were cows on the runway. So we had to make a couple of circles to get them off the runway. And then we landed and a little guy came running out from the uh, station and opened the baggage compartment and was help, going to help us unload. Well, he reached in the compartment before we could say anything to him and he felt the fur on the hood of Janet's um, parka that we had brought down from the North Country. And it was this wolverine fur. And he put his hand in there and grabbed that. Well, he was gone like a shot. <laughs> and we never saw him again. <laughs> I think he thought we had an animal with us. And uh, anyway, we got unpacked and uh, into Puerto Vallarta and we had uh, they, we had reservations there and that's why Raymond had said we might as well go ahead. So we had a wonderful stay there. Uh, Raymond, Janet had brought her homework with her. At 10 years old she didn't have a lot but anyway yeah. her schoolwork. And Raymond would sit every night and help her with her schoolwork. And in the daytime, she rode the Mickey Botter uh, scooter. And she rode with all the little Mexican kids all day on the oh, scooter. And she just loved it. And one day when we went to the beach, uh, we walked to the beach and then we decided we'd take the taxi back for dinner. And when we got to the hotel and got dressed to go downstairs for dinner, she couldn't find her shoes. And I was scolding her for leaving them at the beach or someplace. And we walked down the stairs and the lady at the desk said, did your little girl leave her shoes in the taxi? And I said, well, we couldn't find them. She said, well, the taxi driver dropped them off here. And I thought how many hundreds of little feet those shoes would have fit. And yet he went out of his way to take them back, to bring them back to the hotel. Mexican people are good, are very kind. And But the young fellow stayed and fueled our plane. And uh, so we just took off again got over Montana and the motor quit and we uh, <laughs> kind of upset every both of us but anyway Mickey had his knee pad on his knee and he he was always right on what was happening and immediately he started looking for a strip to set down on and I reached down between the seats and turned the fuel tank to the other tank and the motor started up. <laughs> what a relief. <laughs> but uh, so anyway, we wondered all that time on the way home what had happened because we had fueled up there. And when we landed in, I can't remember whether it was Calgary, I suppose, I suppose, or Lethbridge, we were anxious to see what had happened. And what had happened was the guy was in such a hurry, he hadn't tightened the fuel cap and all the fuel had siphoned out of that, siphoned out of that tank. And so it's a good thing we had two tanks. Indeed. And so he, he wanted to know if I would take them to Fort McMurray. And so I said, well, I could at a certain time. So the four of us went to Fort McMurray. And when we got there, these fellas wanted to go downtown. And uh, so Jack said, well, we'll go downtown and have dinner. 
And I said, well, no, you go downtown and have dinner, and I'll stay and service the plane. And Jack said, no, I'll help you, and then we'll go. So he pulled the uh, gas uh, lever on the, on the pump. Well, or the hose. The hose. He pulled the hose out and stuck it in the gas tank. Unbeknownst to him, there was a rubber cap on the end of the hose. And of course, when he pushed the button, the cap came. No, the cap came off, and the rubber hose went into the tank. And I was just sick. I said, well, we got to get that hose out of there, or that cap out of there, and it was about that long. Sure. And uh, the fellow that, oh, there was an um, airliner came in, and that's why there wasn't anybody there to help, Jack, why Jack was doing it. And then this fellow came over, and he said, can I help you? And we told him what happened. He said, you know, those tanks are made out of uh, uh, canvas, and he said they'll that hose could cause a big problem. And I said, well, I'm, Jack said, well, we can go home on one tank, and I said, no, we're not going home on one tank. We're going to get that thing out of there. Well, the fellow said, I don't know how you're going to do it. He said, we'd have to take the tank apart. And that would mean we'd have to stay overnight. And I said, we can't, we can't do that. And before we got through with the discussion, I said, I'm going to take my rings off and I'm going to cup my hand up and I'm going to reach in there and I think I can get that and so I did that and I reached in and I could feel it right at the bottom of my hand and the bottom of the tank I guess and I wiggled my fingers around until I could caught the the end of the cap and brought it out Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> The guy at the airport couldn't believe it. He said, I think you better leave that hand here. <laughs> he could use it. And uh, so anyway, we came home on two tanks. <laughs> <laughs>